Hola, hola, and buenos dias, GNGs. My name is Trek with two Ks, and this is the Weekend Crypto brought to you here on the Gentleman of Crypto YouTube channel, if you didn't know. The basic idea behind this particular segment is I cover the weekend crypto events or crypto news things that happen from Friday to Sunday, do a nighttime recording, then roll it out on Monday morning before the live stream of King and Zay on Gentleman of Crypto. If you didn't know, now you do know. And so before I jump into these stories, because a number of things did happen, I do want to say thank you to all the folks who are still taking the time to keep abreast of the news, to educating themselves and tapping into the different segments we have here on the Gentleman of Crypto YouTube channel. And thank you for giving my segments, the hearts, the thumbs up, the comments. I appreciate. I know that when the market is down, the sentiment usually dries up across everybody's channel. But we got the folks who are still choosing to educate themselves and to be abreast and aware of what is going on in this crypto space. And if you don't know, we got somebody that covers every segment of this space. If you're in the NFTs, if you're in the trading, TA, all of that stuff, we got somebody for it, okay? Nonetheless, let me jump into these stories. And I got a number of things to run through. I'm trying to be under a certain amount of time. It is definitely hard to do that. First story is basically the crypto lender called Cred blames uphold exchange for an issue of their company going under back in 2020. So here's the basic idea of what happened. Why are you not rolling down? There we go. Basically, their cred makes a lawsuit on Friday against uphold saying, Hey, they basically worked it that the product that we co-partnered on won a flop. And this is basically a thing called earn cred earn which was you put in X amount of whatever the crypto is through the exchange of uphold, you'll earn this thing called cred earn, which would be worth whatever it, it was. I don't remember it partic in particularly, but I would also throw out there that this also shows that there were early hairline or like fractures of how the lending thing was not a sustainable model back then. Like we didn't necessarily get to all the money part, but I just want to throw that out there as a, there were signs back then, but greed is what it is. We all out here chasing the bag in our own ways. But the bottom line of what they're saying is uphold, you guys marketed it as being safe, as being secured, as being assured, as being fully hedged. And apparently the way that cred had loaned out the, the customer deposit, it was over a hundred million. And then things didn't work out the way that they were hoping it would work out. And of course, once things started going awry, uphold, they make their exit stage left and so now you have this situation the other thing i want to point out about this particular story i don't know if anybody was actually on uphold doing this or using cred or whatever i don't think you're getting anything back but i could be totally wrong but the other thing that i do want to point out on this is that what was it yeah this is going to definitely lead to not this but i think it's going to show that there's going to be other individuals and platforms and projects and companies calling each other out about the non-transparent nature of the business back end of this space. We talk about, let me get close for this. We talk about how transparent blockchain is. We talk about how transparent cryptocurrency is supposed to be, but lo and behold, the back end side of the space, as far as the business, the partnerships, those things are not transparent. And that's the traditional business thing itself that's just being carried over here. We're going to see where this goes as the rest of the decade and stuff progresses. But jumping into this next story, this one is about Taiwan. I really coined this. Y'all really have to like do something about this thing here. It is so annoying that it does the roll down thing. Anywho, Taiwan sets a ban set to ban crypto purchases using credit cards. The report comes out. So basically their version of a financial agency, which is a Taiwan's financial supervisory commission is looking to stop the use of credit cards for crypto purchases. According to a local report, the FSC told forecast news on Friday that it had an issue. It had issued a letter to local banking associations in early July, which asked credit card agencies to stop bringing on crypto platforms. Remember, yo. I'm gonna jump back for y'all. Remember, I have been saying this for months that the FICO report came out back in October with the IMF joint that was also in October that was talking about digital currency, digital assets, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technology. And the whole idea was the countries have to do things to throttle adoption, whether you're talking about cryptocurrency or you're talking about the blockchain technology into other industries, throttle adoption through regulation. And this is what we see happening here. Now, of course, other countries are going the total opposite direction and embracing the technology, or at least like the revenue models that can be generated from it. El Salvador is an example. And what's that? The Central African Republic is another example of a country 
country that they're going the opposite way of such as Taiwan right now. The point being here is we're going to see more of this as it goes through the year, as it goes through the decade of countries doing these different things, some in coordination, some not in coordination to either promote or, or hinder the adoption of blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. The other thing I want to point out is I would argue two things on this. You do this as a way of curtailing how people onboard with traditional fiat, it then puts them in a position where they have to figure out other ways to do it. I just want to remind folks, this is a peer to peer technology at the end of the day. That's initially how this thing started. Let's not forget that. And then the other part of it is arguably. This is a form of capital flight control. Just saying, I've been saying this shit for like months now. Capital flight control is going to be put into effect more and more in different ways. So jumping on to this next story, and we're going to jump into everybody's favorite company, which is Tesla. Now, opinion piece, yeah, but it still caught my attention because this dude, Greg, he breaks down how the accounting part of it worked, right? Where it's like the asset of coin on a company sheet of this size is considered this one thing, excuse me, but if they had it labeled out another way, it could actually be more accurate what their value of the holding position is and like what they sold off. And so that's what he breaks down in it. And he's not saying it's like sleight of hand accounting, but he does point out it is not as clear cut as it has been pushed in the media about they sold 75% of their position and it made this a much amount of money for them. I would also add, I'm gonna throw this one up close. I would also add another thing that Scott and me, cause I was really wondering why was it being so focused on? And I get why the maxis were mad about it with pitchforks in their hands and stuff. And then crypto Twitter was just making a crazy funny ass memes about it. And looking at a car company that is supposed to sell cars that didn't make revenue or didn't make a profit in this last cycle, from selling cars. Now, I didn't come up with this idea originally, but it was Ken Skurgeon who said it. And he noted the only reason that he was, well, from what he was understanding and looking at what was made public from Tesla's balance sheet stuff was they only made a profit because they sold a Bitcoin. It wasn't because they sold the cars. So what does that tell you about the bigger picture of the market, of the economy of what's going on and of car sales? I'm just saying. There's certain things that aren't put into full context. And I think that's one of those things about Tesla as a company. It didn't make money from car sales. It was because of the Bitcoin. And I'm not saying that to pump Bitcoin. I'm saying that for you to question what's going on in a bigger economy and in the manufacturing sector. That's what I'm saying. All right, moving on to this next joint. Boom, boom. Come on. There we go. All right. This one, yo, Blockworks, y'all really have to work on y'all titles. Y'all titles be sucking. So latest in crypto hiring, social digital asset platform NAVs, OK Group Exec. Inca Digital Ads, leader focused on the regulatory affairs and digital assets national security implications. All right. So this is a long, like arguably bland article. What is more interesting in this article is that it covers a host of people who are from traditional finance or tech related companies who are now moving into blockchain crypto centered companies or they're moving up in the ranks. Most of these names, unless y'all are really on the business side and you be really scoping out and deep diving on who's the team behind a company or a product, you're not gonna know these names. But I'm gonna still throw out there because I imagine that between now and 2025, these folks are gonna do what they're gonna do because I honestly, for the companies that they named, I don't see anybody being in these positions longer than three years, especially for what they're doing too. That's the other thing. So case in point, the first name they talk about up here is this guy, what is it? Steven Yi, And he was from the OK group. Now he's over at Ernity. And like another name here is Dina Ellis Rockland. She's an advisor. She's a lawyer side of it. DC heavy. A lot of the more business centric folks who are regulatory friendly. When I say regulatory friendly, I mean, 
these are the folks who are like, no, we need regulation and clarity from the government. We need blah, blah, blah from the government or from the agencies that govern this particular sector. They're not about that D Gen D five life. They're not those folks. Same one here, FM Frank Frankel and the company that they're going to, who's another one, Christina Kang. She's another person, Anita Nikolic. I believe I'm saying that maybe. And then Brian Quintez is a number of names on here that I imagine you'll hear things about these companies coming up over the next three years because of these particular people and what they're doing for the departments that they're heading. The other thing I want to note about this, this is happening. So arguably what's happening, right? With this whole thing, I'm going to get up close on this one with companies shrinking their, their worker overhead. How do I say this? You close out X amount of the like menial task stuff or like the lower functioning job positions. And then you get in X amount of these heavy hitter folks who will be able to make the business scale at the business development side, as far as being able to do partnerships, as far as being able to work on the regulatory stuff, as far as being able to move into other markets, you don't necessarily need as many as of the, like the engineers or the customer support people, arguably you do need customer support people, but the way that it seems like these companies are moving, it's you get in these heavy, these heavy hitter people at the more higher level chins in the company to be able to make those partnerships while everything is down right now. And I said this before, and I think others of it, it's a talent acquisition game going on right now. You need X amount of the technical folks but you need a certain level of the business development folks who know and who've already been through certain, what is the word, expansions and like scaling companies. That's what's going on in the space. That's what you're going to see for like the next three, four years. At least that's my perception of it. Again, I'm just some guy on the internet who wears glasses. This ain't financial advice, but that's at least my observation. Nonetheless, I just wanted to throw that out there. Who is this on? This is on Blockworks. And again, their titles suck, but this is actually something informative. If you're really focused on the business side and who to watch over the next like three plus years, I definitely see these people making moves. Next thing. Oh, I totally didn't even read this one. Sorry. I'm gonna jump into this next story. The basic thing behind that was that Alameda was like, Hey, we don't want to take the money from this company because they were really harsh in the terms and conditions. So yeah, they're going to end up taking money from somebody though, at some point, watch nonetheless, jumping into this next thing, the opportunities and risk of metaverse for small businesses. I saw this and I was like, is this really newsworthy? And I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to also say no, because there's a selfish part of why I picked this story in particular. Let me get into it after this. So the basic idea is that this article is breaking down. What are the pros and cons or like the, is it a smart thing to be in the metaverse as a small business? Cause at this point we all know, yes, the major brands are going to be there, but there's also the smaller companies that have opportunity to proliferate within this space too, as far as metaverses right now, one of the things I thought was funny though, was like, it seemed like they found every person that had some kind of product or quotable line to talk to because everyone delivered a quotable line and it's just, eh, that's not a hundred percent true, true, but okay. I got you. Nonetheless, I'm gonna jump into this first one of what I was going to highlight. So they talked to, who is it? John Radoff, CEO of 3d gaming company. Beamable category, and he breaks it down into seven layers. So seven layers are infrastructure, the layer of, this is a layer of semiconductors, material science, cloud computing, telecommunication networks that enable con construction of layers over it. So the infrastructure, right? Then human interface, which is the human interface layer that refers to the hardware that will be used to access the metaverse. That includes everything from mobile devices to VR headsets, Decentral decentralization, build everything on permissionless and distributed and democratized structure. Now, when I saw that one, I was like, I hear you, but that's not how the space, I don't think the industry is going to move that way. I think there will be a combination of decentralized and centralized servers because for this whole tech thing, X amount of it boils down to data storage and like bandwidth of being able to push that data through to have a smooth streaming of whatever it is you're doing. And there's like a whole thing that goes into like how metaverses work on the back end and stuff like that. But nonetheless, the spatial computing that's like getting into like 3D objects and how that allows the hardware to interface and how people will interact with them. The points that he makes are valid as far as what he's breaking down, but I would think how are you conveying this to like small business and 
really, if you're talking about it in these seven points, you're more talking to technical small businesses as opposed to a business that might deal within like marketing or HR or something like that. So this is more favor towards them. That's one thing. Now, then the other part that got me was this line right here where I'm gonna say the author of the article is like many gamers already consider metaverse to be the next frontier in gaming. Developers say today gaming can often feel lonely. In my mind, and I'm not saying I'm super old school in gaming or the metaverse stuff, but one of the things I do know, and the reason I know this is the idea of gaming is the next frontier for metaverse. It doesn't make sense to me only because Metaverses have been around before, like this whole blockchain crypto thing. Second Life has been around forever. Diablo has been around for how long? And I bring this up because me and my homeboy 3D worked to do a, a webinar that breaks down like digital realty, right? The real estate side of the metaverse. Like in all honesty, when it comes to the metaverse thing, if you really want to make the money, coding is the way to go. Bottom line, coding is the way to go. But if you're not going to learn to code and you don't want to lose a lot of money on trading, because you're doing the plots of NFTs and items and blah, blah, blah. Then the other thing is the real estate side of it, right? We did a whole webinar, hour and a half presentation that breaks down the ins and outs and what's the difference between the markets and how the ecosystems and environments can work for people who are not coders and who are not traders. We're going to do another one next month in August, by the way. My point being is that I saw this line and I was like, who is this dude talking to? And then lonely, like the whole point of metaverse is meta, like, Second Life has like a couple thousand people on at a time. What are we talking about here? I don't understand. And so the other thing, this next line right here basically validates what I was saying about the real estate side of the metaverse space where it is going to be a thing. And one of the things that we try to point out in the course that me and 3D had did is that you're not going to be a coder. You're not going to be a trader. It's going to boil down to either you're doing it as advertising or you're doing it as where you're making products and services that people can do use on the plots. That's basically what this guy's talking about, which is the same thing that we do in real world stuff. But Anywho, I'm gonna jump into this next story. I'm sorry. I'm rambling on some of these things, but that one got me only because we did the course, like we, we put the whole thing together and that's the stuff that we was breaking down. And it was like, folks, I don't know, man. Sorry about that. So this next story is about Vitalik Buterin funding AI research grant with last year's Shiba Inu donation. So the bottom line is this last year, somebody randomly dropped Shiba Inu into one of his wallets and it was a. It was an interesting PR stunt on the Shiba Inu community and it's worked for how it's worked for them. There's still people buying Shiba Inu right now. What he then turns around and does is, you know what? I'm gonna make a fellowship and this fellowship is gonna focus on AI. Now, I would argue if you had all the funds and you have the interest of making Ethereum, let me get up close. If you got all this funds and you have the interest of Ethereum meeting this whole new 2.0 thing, like you've been talking and you want stuff to scale and be better than why not do X amount of scholarships or boot camps or some kind of internship thing for the high school range of high school of kids geared towards, Hey, let's do some three month hackathon learning code thing, developing towards a, like solidity or something related around the side chains or whatever. I'm just saying like in the long run, you invest in the human capital resource that would eventually further along the Ethereum protocol and build out further on the EVM. That's just my thought process, but I get it. AI is the hot shit right now as a STEM subject. And it's not like he didn't have people already talking in his ear on how he should move with the funds. I'm not saying he's wrong for doing AI. I'm just saying you would think he would have did something that was more geared towards the EVM environment, but nonetheless, that did happen. And apparently these are the young folks who will be having this opportunity to be a part of his fellowship in the AI essential existential safety, whatever that's going to end up being, but jumping into this next story. So I'm definitely running over on this one more than 20 minutes for sure. Trying to beat it on the 30 basic idea here is California is now allowing people running for office to be able to take contributions in cryptocurrency. Here's the funky part about how this plays out though. So in 2018, they were like, Hey, you can't do that anymore. You got to stop. You can't do it public fairness. That's basically what happened. 
They put a ban on it. It was the state's Fair Political Practices Commission, FPC. And it comes back now in the issue. And the funny way that they explained why they stopped it was because there was a KYC issue of who gave up the money, where did they come from, blah, 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 blah. Mind you, there's a whole bunch of other ways that they put fiat into the political system and you don't know who's who, but whatever. But that was a talking point here. So now they basically say, we got three ways that we can look at this. We either going to say, we're going to maintain the ban, or we're going to treat crypto like cash with a cap of a hundred dollars, or you can have no cap and we'll just have it that you got a KYC if you're putting the money in, but the cash out has to be within 48 hours or something like that. And you have the value marked at transfer. I feel like a number of people are going to finagle how much donations that they had with this little part right here about how you have to go with the value of exchange at the day of transfer. That's what I feel like is in part going to happen. People are going to start finagling their numbers around that. But anyway, that's just my thought process. Nonetheless, I imagine that other states will probably follow something similar where it's going to be like, hey, we're going to start allowing some form of crypto donations, whatever the crypto is, but it's going to be heavy KYC all the way. So if you support your local politicians and they are crypto aware, if you don't care about KYC, it's all cool. Cause you can still do it. This the same. I see more states and cities running along this line, but it's all going to be heavy. D. All right. Jumping into this last story, this last one, basically what happens here was board urges bank of central African states to introduce a common digital currency, basically the collective of these particular countries, which is our Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Equatorial Guinea, Republic of Congo, and a couple of other ones. They're like, hey, we need to do a CBDC, AKA what I call the blue dogs. And so this way they can have what is being argued as a more inclusive financial system that would work across these different regions, like interchangeably across the board. Not really interchangeably because it'd be one currency for all of them, right? Yeah. But this came out as far as the board pushing to the individual countries like, hey, we need to support this move to launch a crypto a CBDC amongst all of the partners of this board. That's basically what they were saying. It's funny because they're not funny, haha, -ha, but it is interesting because the Central African Republic is the only country on this list that actually says, okay, Bitcoin is a legitimate currency and we're going to launch our own, what is it called? A Sango coin. And that happened last month, as far as them launching the Sango coin for the whole tokenization thing. The point being is that there are things happening in the African country, sorry, in the African continent. My bad. I am geographically inclined. I really am. But there are things happening in the continent of Africa individually with these countries, as well as collectively with these countries. And this goes to show that cryptocurrency and blockchain adoption is a, it is not just a first tier country thing. It is not just a Western thing. It is not just a, an, it's a global thing. And I'm glad to see things are happening. I might not be a fan of the direction they're going in, but I, at least we know things are happening. Nonetheless, last thing I do want to say is, like I said, me and my, my guy 3D, we doing this webinar course next month. It will be on Eventbrite. Once I get the link and stuff up, I'll let y'all know where to find it, but that's going down again. And it's the whole breakdown of digital realty. If you're not a coder, you're not a trader. There's other ways of trying to get some gains within the whole metaverse space. And it don't got to be a blockchain based metaverse. It can be a non-blockchain based metaverse too. Nonetheless, I'm closing it out. I am Trek with two Ks. This is a gentleman of crypto YouTube channel, and this is a segment called weekend crypto. And until the next one, one. Two.